Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this online policy dialogue organized by uh, the European Policy Center on Stopping the Russian War Machine, the prospects for EU and US energy sanctions, which has been kindly supported by the US mission to the EU. My name is Simo Mikero, the Climate and Energy Policy Analyst for the Sustainable Prosperity for Europe program of the EPC, and I will be moderating the event for you today. Today's discussion will focus on energy sanctions against Russia and the role these measures can play in halting the Russian war machine in Ukraine. Energy exports, most of which are directed uh, towards Europe, are by, are by far the most important source of income for the Russian state. In 2021, revenues from oil and gas accounted for 45%, almost, almost half of Russia's federal budget. In this way, effective energy sanctions can deal a heavy blow to the Russian economy and can cut a direct and vital source of funding for its war of aggression against Ukraine. This has also been recognized on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, the US has imposed a full embargo on the import of Russian crude, petroleum, LNG, and coal. The EU, on the other hand, has announced phased in import bans for oil and coal products. These measures have, however, not been able to affect Russian energy revenues to a significant extent, as soaring oil and gas prices have offset reduced export volumes. In fact, they are currently doing, and they are currently uh, doing the exact opposite. As we see in May, uh, Russia's revenue from oil exports alone amounted to 20 billion dollars, uh, which is a 50% increase compared to January. New measures are needed if you want to stop these massive inflows of capital financing the war in Ukraine. As the discussions on a price cap for Russian oil during the past G7 uh, summit have shown. This is more easily said than done and will require transatlantic cooperation as well as the support from, all, from other major energy consuming countries in, in order to be affected. This policy dialogue will focus on what these measures, these new measures could entail and how the EU and the US can coordinate and cooperate in designing and, and enforcing energy sanctions that truly disrupt the Russian war machine. To discuss these topics, uh, these topics today, uh, we have uh, four speakers joining us. Uh, Dan Fried, distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, George Zakman, a, a senior fellow at Bruegel. Filina Chakarova, director of the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy. And Yuri Vitrenko, uh, CEO of Naftogas. Thank you very much for all, all these speakers uh, for taking the time to be with us here today. We will first have introductory remarks from each of the panelists, after which we will open the floor for questions from the audience. I would encourage, uh, encourage participants to already write down any questions you might have. Uh, during the presentations of our speakers, you, uh, using the Q&A function of Zoom, and to please uh, keep the question short so it, it is easier for us to keep an overview. If you wish to do so, you may also intervene directly uh, during the Q&A session by raising your hand in Zoom. Without uh, much further ado, I would then like to give the floor to our first speaker today, Dan Fried, uh, fellow at the Atlantic Council, who will give us uh, uh, a US perspective on the energy sanctions debate. Thank you. You set up the discussion well, and I'm going to jump right in. In sanctions, a good guide is usually to follow the money. Russia makes its money through oil sales as its number one export, gas sales as its number two export. And after that, um, I think gold is pretty high as well. You described the US sanctions against Russia, against, well, US ban on purchases of Russian energy. That hardly counts because we're not enough of a, of a, of a purchaser to make it a big hit. Uh, the EU, after a difficult internal discussion, did decide to cut up to 90% of its imports of Russian oil by the end of the year, uh, with some carve-outs for countries that are particularly affected. The trouble is, and you put it well, the Russians can undercut the intent of these sanctions by selling their oil to third countries. They are already doing so to India, not in massive quantities, but uh, also to China and elsewhere. They are able to offer discounts to incentivize new customers, 
uh, and still make more money because of the high price of oil. Now, it's not the sanctions that caused the high price of oil. The war caused the high price of oil. But the problem remains, even though the G7 hit the Russian foreign exchange reserves by locking down, essentially freezing over half of them, over $300 billion of foreign exchange reserves. Russia's income from energy sales means that it can continue its war effort. Therefore, for the past few weeks, the US administration and some, Ger and some European governments, I have in mind particularly the Germans, have been looking at alternatives, ways to cut Russian income from oil sales. Oil, they chose oil because gas is even harder. And oil, going after oil sales would be a big deal. The point is not simply cutting the volume of oil Russia sells. The point is to cut the income that Russia derives from those sales. Um, originally, some Europeans were thinking about imposing higher tariffs on uh, say on um, imports of Russian oil and perhaps uh, using the difference uh, using the difference to fund uh, to to escrow a, a, a large portion of this and maybe even send it back to Ukraine um, but tariffs are complicated the second thing that the US and Europe settled on as a, a way of approaching the issue, uh, uh, has been a price cap. This was very popular with the US Treasury Department. They like the intellectual elegance. A price cap, of course, would not be, would not be one imposed on US and European purchases of Russian oil because we're already getting out of that business. It would have to be imposed on third country purchases of Russian oil. That means that the G7, US, Europe, Japan, would have to find a means to convince or push India, China, and other potential importers of Russian oil to accept a lower price to respect a price cap of, I'm making this up, $30 or $50 a barrel, well below even the price of Russian discounted oil, but above the cost of production, so it would still pay for Russia to export the oil, but so low that they would have, they would see a massive cut in their income. Now, as I said, there is a certain elegance in this proposal. The problem would come with enforcement. The G7 is in the awkward position of having announced that it is exploring this option, but not having agreement on how to, uh, how to actually make the measure worse, uh, work. The US is in consultations with India and probably other countries about the potential for India to respect a price cap. There is a certain logic, India, in principle, doesn't like secondary sanctions. And the US and Europe would have to enforce a price cap by the threat of secondary sanctions or by the threat of a ban on all insurance or shipping for that oil, probably both. And that principled opposition to secondary sanctions could be mitigated by the fact that if India agreed to accept them, they would be saving themselves a lot of money. So would China. That is the argument for the price cap. My colleague at the Atlantic Council and former colleague in the US government when we were doing sanctions uh, on Russia together after the initial uh, Russian invasion in 2014 has advocated this. A number of people, as I said, in Treasury Department and the NSC have pushed this. It's not yet clear that it will be practical. There is a problem of enforcement. There is a problem of circumvention. There are a number of people who think it is not practical. I wrote about this with my colleague, Brian O'Toole, in a piece that came out last Friday. An alternative to a price cap 
might be the use of sanctions to prevent the Russians from converting income that they received for their oil in the form of rupees or renminbi or other currencies to prevent them from converting that into dollars, yen, euros, pounds, or Swiss francs, Swiss francs or other convertible currencies. That could be done through sanctions on Gazprom Bank or other Russian banks. Again, enforcement would be a challenge. There's no perfect solution, but the goal to cut back on, num on Russia's number one export in a time of war is something we need to address and hopefully solve and do so soon. So this discussion is timely. The issue is in motion. The Biden administration is working this very hard. It's not clear that a mechanism can be found, but the administration likely believes it is possible or they wouldn't have launched the initiative in public. So watch the space. You are hosting, the EPC is hosting a discussion on a policy issue that is that is of major importance, major complexity, and in motion right now. Um, economic pressure on Russia can work. It won't work with the immediate impact that many hope, and none of us ever expected that it would. But it can undercut Russia's ability to sustain its war. That combined with Ukraine's resistance, and I congratulate the Ukraine on forcing the Russians off of Serpent Island. News of that is broken in recent hours. It can provide Ukraine the basis to succeed strategically. So thanks for the opportunity. I am looking forward to the discussion and I expect I will learn a great deal. So thank you. Thank you very much. I definitely agree with you on uh, the complexity and, and the timeliness of the issue at hand and also the, the effectiveness of, of sanctions. As yesterday, I saw the tweet from one of uh, George's colleagues that that the uh, sanctions that the sanctions uh, on on the car industry have reduced the Russian car output by 97 percent in the month of May um, compared to uh, May uh, 2021. So that is a clear indication uh, of of what sanctions are effective, uh, are, are, are capable of doing and shows uh, how we really need to address this issue on both sides of uh, the Atlantic. Uh, then I would uh, like to give uh, the word to uh, George. Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Simon. Thanks a lot for the invitation and um, great to, to speak after, uh, after Dan, who laid out the, the topic so, uh, so clearly. Now, uh, my assessment of the situation is that we are currently in the worst of all worlds. So the EU has announced sanctions on energy that will only gradually kick in and reduce essentially the volumes of energy that the EU itself currently still needs. And what actually happens is we don't have sanctions yet that are active while the Russians already reduce the gas flows quite dramatically to Europe and started to reroute oil flows to other parts of the world. Even so, the sanctions are not yet uh, uh, really implemented on the European side. So we get last week about a third of the gas from Russia that we would usually get, but we pay about 10 times the price. So they are making more money with less volumes. And um, for oil, we are also um, seeing kind of exploding global, uh, global prices. Um, what Russia has been doing on sanctioning us, and I think we, 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 we should call it uh, as it is, is they have broken uh, essentially all the contracts uh, that they had, uh, the long-term contracts. There is no more trust in each other, uh, something that has been established for 50 years. Um, they um, linked this to undoing our sanctions. So they linked this to kind of opening Nord Stream 2. They linked it to, uh, to the technology sanctions. They linked it to the, uh, to the ruble payment uh, scheme in order to undermine our sanctions. They benefit from the higher prices and they try to keep our storages dry. They are in the driving seat at the moment in this energy uh, economic war. And we are just 
kind of trying to, to follow up and we need to get rolling quickly because uh, as it is an economic war, also initiative matters and we are not really in a driving seat here. Economists from the beginning of the war have been calling for price-based mechanisms rather than volume-based mechanisms because it seems quite clear that what Europe wants is we want to get volumes but cheaply and we don't want to give money to Putin. Now what we are getting is we are getting uh, we are going to pay them a lot of money and we are getting smaller volumes than before so something is is really uh, really wrong here so what can be done well the main problem is that we are afraid and i think we are afraid for good reasons first oil and gas are related i mean if we uh, if we kind of sanction them completely on oil there is a risk that uh, that the regulation will be on the gas side and i think most of the worry on the european end is in terms of gas supplies um yesterday a study in germany was again published saying something like 13 percent of gdp will be lost if the uh, uh, if the russian gas flow stops we will have millions of unemployed so that's that's the sort of conversation that we are having in europe still um despite all the other uh, analysis that show the impacts will be uh, will be less severe at the same time we are not well prepared for the crisis and that might actually mean that the cost of the of the gas supply stop will potentially be not in the in the lower end of the Bachmann study, but maybe in a significantly uh, a higher order of magnitude, because our policymakers are afraid of telling population where we are. Uh, because they are afraid of telling us you need to uh, reduce energy consumption now uh, on all fronts. We are still subsidizing consumers for using more energy, which means we are putting more money into the pockets of Putin and we are getting ourselves more into this uh, um, into this dead end situation in, uh, in which we are with every day that passes towards the winter. So what should be done? We should first no stone in terms of increasing supplies should remain untouched. And we have still a bit of options to increase energy supplies in Europe, things that have been not done before because of, um, at the time, lower prices and environmental, social, and other considerations that were well advised at that time, but not in a, in a, in a current crisis situation. So we should increase uh, a supply wherever possible, both electricity, own gas production, and so on. The second is demand reduction. Demand reduction is key in all sectors. And, and here, um, I mean, we first have to tell population, but we also need to pass through pri uh, price signals to people to understand that they need to save for their own good because we need to get down on, on a European average by about 20% in terms of gas consumption. And if member states don't work together, it might mean that countries like Germany have to reduce gas consumption by 30% if we are not getting Russian gas. And this threat of not getting Russian gas will always be out there and will prevent us from, from uh, doing extra steps. So the, the, the last element is unity. And in terms of unity between the member states, we not only need some sort of joint procurement from the uh, from the European member states. We published a paper on that last week, but also we need support from the US. It is, in my view, quite important because the US has become an energy superpower in the past decade. They have available not only gas and oil, but they can also produce a lot of energy intensive products that they can uh, bring to Europe. We should find ways to more closely work together on this. We should potentially help the US to, uh, or kind of encourage the US to build up more renewables, do things that they can do there to make available more energy for Europe, uh, reduce demand also in the US in order to be able to, uh, to help European consumers. Now, if we manage to, uh, to get ahead with this, uh, with this preparation, if we are well prepared, we can do the following. We could essentially uh, introduce sanctions that prevent EU companies from buying gas from, from Gazprom. No more bilateral gas dealings. And we just install a European institution that buys Russian gas and that then sells it to the market. And this institution is offering a price that is acceptable to us uh, for a volume that we, uh, that we need. Something like to the order of 50 euros per megawatt hour for 50 billion cubic meter, if you want to be generous with Putin. Now, if we are well prepared, I would presume there's high chances that we, uh, that we get these volumes. It will make us much better off than the situation we are currently in, and it will uh, stabilize our, uh, our economies over the next winter. Now, I ha also have some thoughts on the, on the price cap mechanism, but maybe we can leave that for the, uh, for the discussion. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. Um, yes, of course, uh, there is some sort of a complacency or rather uh, some sort of a lack of political courage right now in Europe 
that we are seeing that we are um, we already have announced measures, but they are not effectively uh, hitting Russian revenues uh, uh, because the only their announcement uh, effectively of these embargoes have already increased the prices uh, hugely. And uh, of course, everybody recognizes that we are kind of in the in the in the end game, but that doesn't mean that. Uh, we cannot do something that works already this month or next month instead of uh, a phased in embargo that will only uh, start really reducing, hitting Russian revenues in, 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 in a couple of months from now. So, um, yeah. Uh, so then I would like uh, to give the word to uh, Vilina, who can maybe also reflect on, the, on how necessary the cooperation of other partners uh, will be to make these sanctions really effective, uh, mainly for oil. Uh... Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to the colleagues, uh, to Daniel and Georg, who actually already outlined uh, pretty uh, clearly the main problems and also the state of affairs. So I will allow myself a rather geopolitical uh, point uh, or let's say perspective on the current uh, situation when it comes to the energy sector. And as someone uh, who has been covering uh, this particular geopolitical uh, domain uh, of the energy sector for quite some time now, I can note hide my frustration that a lot of what is going on right now uh, when it comes to the intentions of the European Union uh, and the member states to diversify away from Russia as quickly as possible, of course, in both oil and uh, gas sector, is in fact self-inflicted uh, pain. Uh, Following the previous invasion of Ukraine in 2014, the problem was already clear that dependence on a sole energy supplier is obviously not an option. And in geopolitical terms, uh, no a significant uh, uh, actor on the global arena is in fact pursuing this kind of strategy to be dependent on the sole energy supplier. However, what happened in reality is that uh, some of the member states, uh, in fact, uh, not even uh, did not even, inc not only um, refrained from uh, actually launching uh, uh, such measures to diversify, but in fact increased the dependence. And um, being based in Vienna, I can give you the perfect example with Austria, which in fact had around 60% dependence on Russian gas supply uh, following the invasion of Ukraine in 2014. Uh, this dependence increased uh, by the beginning of uh, the war on 24th of February, by uh, is actually was meanwhile at 83 percent. So you obviously see that uh, there was no sense of urgence, no sense of threat, and uh, there was this main narrative uh, coming from the European capitals that uh, Russia has never used uh, energy as a political weapon. Now, as it was already mentioned by my colleagues, in fact, we witnessed that Russia is indeed using energy and energy supplies as a geopolitical weapon to increase the pressure, of course, on political decision makers. Uh, but also, I argue that right from the beginning of this war on the 24th, uh, in fact, Russia uh, has factored in, in this exact geopolitical, but also geoeconomic um, environment and context, because Moscow knew very well already uh, from last year that the soaring energy and also food prices would be uh, significantly amplified by the war. And this is exactly what's been in the making. Why is it important from Moscow's perspective? Because on the one side, it creates additional political pressure on our decision makers. And at some point of time, it will seek to, uh, to link the lifting of uh, par partially, at least uh, the sanctions to, for instance, exports of critical commodities. And uh, among which I uh, I'm afraid that we will probably see also a certain uh, amount of, um, of uh, energy supply. In the short term, let's be very clear, there is no way for Europe to diversify away from the Russian gas supply in the short term. So that means that, that means that we are speaking about probably a window of opportunity. And of course, the measures will, uh, were taken, the political measures, the intention of cutting off two-thirds of the um, 
uh, Russian uh, gas supply to Europe in general, uh, as also we've heard already the 90% of Russian oil. Yes, these are political measures, but the reality uh, on the ground as such is that in some member states, there is simply no plan B for now. And it's not because of Russia. It's because of the own decision makers who have not done their homework, who have not provided for plan B. Now, in many of these um, uh, cases, when we reach out to other partners, to other suppliers, it's not possible to actually uh, sign a deal uh, in the short term. Most, for instance, uh, of the LNG uh, deals are long-term oriented deals, uh, even if uh, Europe relies on, U uh, on the United States now, as it was already mentioned, uh, as a significant energy supplier, uh, specifically uh, in the field of liquefied natural gas. Uh, there will be a very limited share of this uh, 150 to 200 billion cubic meters that the United States will be able, able to cover for the European demand. Uh, of course, I want to focus more on gas right now because on oil it was uh, said a lot and I really want to just to uh, focus on some issues that haven't been uh, mentioned. Also, of course, what is important is that it was created this kind of uh, false feeling of stability when it comes to energy supplies. Um, and it was always more or less linked, uh, so this kind of stability, not only uh, with uh, the lack of uh, energy being used as a geopolitical weapon, but also uh, basically, uh, the options, so let's say Plan B, C, D, would have uh, meant that the European Union and the European members would have had to reach out to uh, countries uh, with, uh, let's say, questionable record on human rights. And as you know, the European Union, which strives to become a geopolitical actor, but in my view is, isn't such, is a, is, is a, is a very uh, significant geoeconomic actor, of course, but still does not have this geopolitical portfolio. Uh, is going to struggle to explain to the European citizens why, for instance, uh, energy supply um, from countries like uh, Qatar or uh, Saudi Arabia or the Emirates um, or take whatever, uh, whichever country you want uh, from this list uh, is going to uh, be, uh, you know, um, will, will, will make more sense for the European citizens if they actually link it to the values-based approach that we are used to listening to from our uh, decision makers. So it's a very critical role on the side of the political elites to explain also to the society that energy and raw materials uh, can, never be, uh, can never be linked to values-based approach. In the world, we have a lot of uh, a lot of producers, a lot of suppliers. But when it comes to to these specific uh, policies, it is important to be real, uh, uh, to 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 apply real politic approach and to explain also to the population why is it important. So, uh, last point on my side, I don't want to be too uh, too long on that matter, is that. Um, it is also, I, I think, important right now when we hear and uh, listen to the narrating coming, uh, narrative coming from Moscow that uh, the soaring energy and um, commodities prices are due to the sanctions. We need to explain also, not only to our population, but also to the international community that this narrative, this specific narrative, of course, is wrong. It's not because of the sanctions. As I said, it was an absolutely deliberate policy to amplify, uh, to amplify the repercussions. Uh, there are many structural causes and factors. We don't have the time to explain it right now. Why we are, why we were at this oil price before the war began. Why were the food uh, prices uh, soaring before the war began. In fact, the food prices, uh, the, the index reached the uh, Arab Spring levels already in December last year. But I think that if we use logical uh, arguments, logic arguments, and we explain this transparently to the population, we are in already in this disinformation war. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, uh, equally important to reach out to the international community. If you go to uh, New Delhi, uh, and I've been uh, to New Delhi in April, you will hear a completely different narrative 
about what's going on and who is actually, uh, whose fault is it uh, that uh, we are in this precarious food and famine crisis. If you go to Beijing, probably the narrative will be similar. Um, and uh, to conclude uh, about uh, something that I think is also important. Throughout the last eight years, and I argue that uh, the Russian president and uh, Russia specifically has been preparing for this, uh, for this war over the last eight years, there was this main, main uh, argument that we were trying to also um, bring in uh, publicly that uh, Nord Stream 2.0 is in fact not a commercial project. And in fact, the moment when Nord Stream 2.0 would become operational, it will uh, be the green light for military attack on Ukraine, because at this very moment, uh, it will no longer, so Moscow will no longer need the pipelines in Ukraine. So right now, unfortunately, the reality in 2022 has shown that uh, exactly that this has been the case, uh, with unfortunately the worst scenario of all that have been actually applied during the last eight years. And I think that uh, uh, from now on, when we talk about energy projects, we need to be very vigilant about what is really commercial project or not. I argue that uh, energy, as I said, and energy projects in the future uh, have to be linked to, uh, uh, re, uh, to, to real politic and to geopolitical considerations, a bit uh, regarding one or other European capitals, or when it comes to the European Union as a common geopolitical actor. Thank you very much. Uh, I think a very good uh, argument also uh, with uh, relation to, uh, with regard to real politic approach to uh, energy, uh, which I think will be a very hard. Uh, uh, pill to swallow for European policymakers, uh, even though they we have already been uh, setting uh, or, or normative agenda aside with, for instance, uh, the Southern Gas Corridor, where we uh, cooperated with uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Turkmenistan, and 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 also Iran to see if uh, they uh, could connect their gas supplies to us, and ultimately, of course, only Azerbaijan uh, doing so. Uh, but now I would like to give the word to uh, Yuri Vitrenko, CEO of Naftogaz, to give us an uh, Ukrainian perspective on these debates. We, we often forget, uh, we often talk about, uh, at least in the EU, talk about what the effect is on or, or the impact of the sanctions will be on our economies. But that's, of course, not what uh, these debates, uh, um, what, what it is actually about. What will they do uh, against, how will they stop the Russian war machine in Ukraine? That's uh, what uh, the debate really should be about. So um, uh, without much further ado, uh, Yuri. Hello. Go ahead. Uh, hello, um, um, everyone. Um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity uh, to speak. Um, and thank you, EPC, for organizing uh, this uh, event. Um, Ukraine uh, is uh, on a front line of this war that uh, Russia waged, this barbaric war that Putin's regime waged, uh, not just against Ukraine, uh, but against uh, the West, against the civilized world, trying to change the world order and to go back to this concept of uh, spheres of influence, of uh, balance of power that uh, we remember from the 19th century that led to horrific events like the, uh, the uh, World War I and the World War II. So that is why it is really impo uh, important. And uh, I agree with everything uh, uh, that uh, you have just said, that we need to stop this war. We need to win this war. Otherwise, uh, uh, again, Putin uh, will change the world order uh, to the detriment of uh, all the civilized people in the world. Now, uh, back to the topic of this particular uh, event. Um, I would like to start uh, with uh, some comments about how we uh, got here. I would mention, um, I would call it a reckless energy policy uh, of the European Union in particular that allowed critical dependence on Russian gas, 
that allowed dominance of Gazprom in the European gas market, and that allowed Gazprom to abuse its dominance without consequences. Uh, I would reiterate that, for example, uh, we saw record uh, high prices in December last year, before the war. So it's a, a narrative that is used by Russian propaganda now to connect high prices with the war. Again, we saw record high prices before the war. So Russia, abusing their dominance, started to decrease supplies to Europe last summer, driving prices to levels that are higher than now, before the war. So what else do you need uh, as an evidence that it's not just the problem of the war, as many would like to position it nowadays? Second, I would also say that, uh, as a matter of fact, we see that the sanctions uh, of 2014 and 2015 did not stop Putin. Uh, I would say it had an opposite effect. So Putin hoped that sanctions this time for an invasion of Ukraine, a full-scale war, would be as innocent, as weak, as toothless as he perceives the sanctions from 2014 and 2015. And it's not just about energy. It's about, for example, Russian oligarchs uh, enjoying their splendid lifestyles even after the invasion of Crimea. So they violated the, the world order, but they were allowed, again, to have this life in Europe, to have football clubs, uh, yachts, uh, to go to operas in Vienna or in, in Berlin or in Munich like, as respected uh, people. I would also mention that the climate policy of the West was at least uh, geopolitically unsustainable. Uh, because yes, everybody cared about the environmental sustainability, but you also should care about geopolitical sustainability because geopolitical sustainability is intertwined with environmental sustainability and we now bear the consequences. And last but not least, uh, again, when you print money, you have inflation. It's not because of the war. We all know about trillions of money printed in the West, trying to ease the effects of the COVID pandemic. And then it had an effect on inflation. So now the problem is that we have this inflation coming from inflationary pressures, from money printing. Uh, we have, again, geopolitically unsustainable climate policy we have dominance of Gazprom, we have abuse of dominance by Gazprom, and on top of, of, of it, we have a war. And it's not a coincidence that we have this war, because Putin uh, at least exploited this vulnerability of the West, if not basically created this vulnerability through his agents, through so-called active operations. So the war is an effect of it. It's not a reason for that. And we should not confuse this cause and effect uh, um, ties. Now about the state of play. So of course, it's better late than never. So we see finally some serious sanctions about uh, Putin's regime. That's of course, it's a very good thing. I would also say that um, the sanctions are not crushing as uh, some administrations uh, uh, declared uh, uh, sanctions would be. They're more like suffocating sanctions. Um, Daniel said that nobody hoped uh, that it would be, we would see some crashing sanctions, but it's a little bit um, not consistent with the declarations we heard. But also, again, when we talk about some suffocating sanctions, we should understand that uh, it may ease uh, from one point of view, some kind of economic situation uh, in Europe. Uh, it would help, again, uh, the current administration in the US maybe uh, before the uh, elections in autumn, but although it's arguable. But it also means that Putin has more time to adapt to the sanctions, to find ways around it. But also, again, it allows him to continue financing the war machine, to continue enjoying social support in Russia, because he can still pay, again, pensions, uh, a social care, whatever in, in Russia. So that 
a society that he turned to be uh, into a fascist, fascist society supports his regime because of the billions he is getting every day from the West for energy exports. Uh, and when there are some really uh, efficient sanctions, like for example, sanctions like on insurance for shipping, when they really start biting, when they really start having an effect, uh, then immediately people feel some pressure on, for example, energy prices. And we hear, for example, from the US that, uh, again, it uh, drives uh, gasoline prices even further. And it's a political problem for an incumbent uh, administration. So that's why, of course, we are in a rather difficult situation when finally we start uh, seeing some uh, effective sanctions. But at the same time, we start hearing about, oh, maybe it's too radical. So what needs to be done? First of all, um, I would uh, strongly encourage this discussion on the on the price cap because uh, again, it, at least uh, it goes into the right direction in terms of a discourse. But uh, I would uh, suggest at least discussing uh, an implementation mechanism for these uh, sanctions. So we call it a transfer cap, meaning that uh, uh, instead of just limiting at the maximum price you can pay for Russian oil and gas, you limit a maximum um, amount of money per, for example, megawatt hour or per barrel of oil that you can transfer to Russia. And it's implemented through financial sanctions. Financial sanctions are very easy to implement because uh, banks, they know how to deal with financial sanctions. They usually... Um, try to follow uh, the letter and the, the spirit of the financial sanctions. They have a lot to lose. So that's why it's more efficient mechanism. So basically you say you pay whatever you are obliged to pay under the existing contract or any other contract you might have, but the bank will uh, uh, control that, for example, you cannot transfer more than $30 per barrel or for example, 20, uh, 20 euros per megawatt hour uh, for gas. And then uh, the rest is uh, frozen and Russia can take this money only when they withdraw from Ukraine, when they stop the war and they pay reparations. It also motivates Russia to send more oil and gas to the market because uh, they will get more money. So they increase the volume. And if there is a transfer cap per volume, per port, per basically barrel of oil or per megawatt hour, if they send more, they get more money. At the same time, again, we pay less and in total, Putin's regime get much less money because of this uh, transfer cap idea. Just to finish, I would also mention that uh, uh, with more efficient financial sanctions, for example, through this transfer cap, it's easier to implement secondary sanctions and secondary sanctions should be discussed at least as a credible threat. And last but not least, uh, uh, we cannot get away uh, to uh, solve this problem of uh, environmentally and geopolitically unsustainable energy sector in the West without taxes on uh, carbon uh, at, at, the, at the level of consumers. And that's a good thing to see that EU is finally talking about it. I understand that because of political problems, the current administration cannot suggest uh, increasing taxes, although it's very sad, because if in general, as a world, as the Western world, we don't want to depend on rogue regimes like Putin. And we want our, uh, our kids to live again in a world without a devastating climate change. We should reduce carbon consumption. And it's only possible if we start taxing uh, any fuel and any energy uh, based on its carbon content. And I'm open to all the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, comments on uh, this uh, debate. Uh, maybe first I would like to get uh, George's reactions to, to, to the transfer cap mechanism, as I know that uh, uh, Bruegel has made uh, similar arguments uh, for a var variable uh, import tariff that could be uh, changed, um, that uh, could be changed uh, depending on uh, Russia's uh, willingness uh, or, or Russia's cooperation or withdrawal or withdrawal from uh, Ukraine. So, yeah. 
Yeah, thanks a lot. No, uh, that, that was a lot of very interesting ideas. And maybe starting with the, with the last point, I, uh, I very much also under uh, write this point of carbon prices as a as essentially a form of a fossil import tax, because uh, in the end of the day, uh, that will help us to uh, to extract um, rents from the uh, from the energy producers as as Europeans if we manage to uh, to completely. Uh, uh, put a carbon price on all fossil fuels. So I think that is a very, very good and very, very straightforward idea. And it would be great if one could roll that out in the um, in the entire sort of OECD world. On the uh, on the transfer cap, um, maybe first one one question to to Yuri for my for my better understanding. Uh, do you think about that as something that only uh, the um, the kind of um, exports to uh, to the Western world um, uh, includes, or would you think about this transfer cap as something that we would also try to impose on sales to uh, to India and China? Uh, it works in the following way. So you impose it through the mechanism of financial sanctions, and it's reinforced through uh, sanctions on uh, shipping insurance. It means that uh, hypothetical Indian or Chinese buyer can buy it, but then they should pay through some dodgy banks. Uh, that would not be afraid of financial sanctions. And I don't really uh, know uh, such banks because what we see as a matter of fact, Chinese banks are afraid of financial sanctions and they do not violate the financial sanctions, by the way. Also in terms of these uh, sanctions on shipping insurance, again, as we see as a matter of fact, again, as soon as Brits basically uh, impose the sanctions, it had an immediate effect on the entire world because again, you can use some smaller shipping operators, but it would be very expensive and not enough basically for such huge volumes of crude, for example. In terms of natural gas, it's not relevant. Again, it's about pipeline exports, so where you're not afraid at all. They cannot divert uh, pipeline gas from Europe to China or to India uh, within a year or two or three or five even, you see? So that is why I think this combination of financial sanctions and again, reinforcement through uh, uh, insurance shipping sanctions uh, can work even in relation to China and India. So it applies to the whole world. Maybe an, another follow up. I think it's also potentially helpful for the for the for the listener to to understand. Um, so the um, the transfer cap kind of would it replace the the European volume uh, reduction uh, plans and the and the and the full embargo from the uh, from the US or would it uh, be essentially that we continue to to try to move to zero while um, uh, while at the same time this uh, this transfer cap is implemented to to non OECD countries. That's a good and tricky question because ideally, of course, in the ideal world, we would like to have a full embargo on Russian oil and gas. That's what we're advocating, frankly. But then we say that if somebody, I mean, some country is saying, look, we're too, too critically dependent on Russian gas, we cannot do it now. Then there shouldn't be an exemption from this general uh, embargo uh, that if you uh, continue buying uh, Russian oil and gas, you can do it only if you pay to accounts that are under these financial sanctions, you see? And you can get this product only if you use, for example, shipping companies, uh, again, an insurance uh, for the shipping companies that is also connected to this financial sanction. So it also helps to enforce uh, this, uh, these sanctions. So a short answer, I would say that in the short term, for at least for Europe and for other countries like China and India, uh, this transfer cap is an alternative to full embargo. Uh, for the US, probably US doesn't need to import uh, Russian oil anyway, so it can leave uh, just with a full embargo. And uh, US is not importing Russian pipeline gas, so it's not even relevant. May I just uh, kick in with a very short remark, because uh, Yuri was uh, speaking about an ideal world, but we are not living in an ideal world. The real world is uh, far, far away from an ideal one. And uh, the reality on the ground shows uh, uh, a clear surge um, in oil supplies uh, by both China and uh, India. In fact, uh, China took over from Germany for the very first time as the biggest 
importer of Russian oil. And also, of course, I argue that uh, Russia has learned its lesson from Iran, from countries like Iran, how to actually place, for instance, oil on the black and the gray markets. And I argue that, of course, uh, there will be ways to ship uh, Russian oil that will be, of course, uh, not Russian, not described as Russian uh, for the sake of uh, this uh, kind of business deal. So I don't see uh, in this short term, once again, uh, a way that countries like China in India, let me remind you that China has announced decarbonization not early than 2060. India, in fact, has announced decarbonization uh, not early than 2070. And there are plenty of other Asian uh, countries that are uh, on uh, en route to, you know, uh, to economic growth uh, uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so long as this international isolation, when it comes to energy supply, specifically, of course, uh, fossil fuels, is not in place, combined, of course, with the Western sanctions, I don't see a way uh, for, um, for our uh, policies for our European and Western policies that, to be uh, efficient uh, in the long run. So we need to, bre to break this uh, international support, uh, which I think that for the moment uh, is going to be tricky because contrary to uh, United States, Europe is energy deprived region and Europe will remain energy deprived region and will be further dependent on uh, energy supplies, but also on raw materials. And here, once again, we have another key issue that no one wants to or a few want to point to on our way to towards decarbonization, we may we run the risk of replacing one dependence namely the one on Russian energy, uh, by another, namely the dependence on uh, raw materials, minerals for the decarbonization for the EV sector uh, from China. Thank you very much. Um, maybe related to that, um, as you say, uh, many countries, uh, countries like uh, Iran and, and Venezuela have long had, uh, had have had many experiences with uh, redirecting uh, their oil supplies, even uh, and and and, and uh, kind of sidestepping uh, sanctions, which uh, lessons which can also be very helpful for Russia uh, for um, sidestepping sanctions or oil, oil sanctions. And then my question would be: um, Isn't it isn't it then more interesting now uh, to look or or shouldn't shouldn't the priority be now gas sanctions, where it will be much harder? Uh, for Russia to actually redirect its uh, supplies uh, towards other markets because it simply does not have uh, the, the infrastructure in place. It has a pipeline towards China, but with limited capacity. And, um, and, and it doesn't have LNG infrastructure to really um, uh, export its gas that it would normally export to the EU to other markets. So uh, wouldn't that... Uh, have more potential right now to really hit uh, Russian revenues. Maybe um, first, uh, Dan can uh, comment on this. First, on the issue of enforcement of oil sanctions, let's accept that it will never be 100%. But we don't need 100%. We need to eat into Russian revenues from oil sales, not eliminate them completely. I mean, I'd love to eliminate them completely, but it's good enough to hit them hard. It doesn't have to be complete. Secondly, the Iranian sanctions were labor intensive. The oil sanctions on Iran required a tremendous amount of work by the US government <laughs> to enforce. And they generally worked. China and India respected them. It was imperfect. The Iranians found ways to cheat, but generally they did not succeed in breaking the sanctions. Third, 
of course the sanctions will have to be enforced by the threat of secondary sanctions against China and India. That's a daunting prospect, but it's not an impossible one. I don't know the nature of the US-India discussions about the oil price cap. I know that they're going on. The Chinese on the level of strategic rhetoric are unlikely to change their support for Putin. At the level of economic behavior, as several people on the panel have said, the Chinese are being circumspect, not challenging the US. Therefore, some means to reduce Ru Ru Russian revenue from its oil sales, whether a price cap or a financial sanctions mechanism to reduce the convertibility of currencies that the Russians receive for their oil. Enforced by the threat of secondary sanctions, as it would have to be, may be a way to go. Look, everybody in sanctions policy in the sanctions policy world seeks easily implementable options with high impact and no downside risks. They usually don't exist. If we mean it, if we mean are serious about countering. Putin's threat to us all through his war in Ukraine, then we need to push our respective governments and work on the details of various proposals, pros and cons, to help them come up with the right solution. They're doing this now. Like the, the, the G7 discussion on price caps is left the US and Europe in the awkward position of having launched but not delivered on an initiative. That's the bad news. The good news is they need to deliver. So I think Yuri Vitrenko is right. Things like insurance, shipping, banking, all have to be, all have to be used as levers of enforcement for whatever we come up with for oil. We also have to look at other Russian exports. The G7 did that by banning gold. Um, there was a rather interesting article published a few hours ago in Newsweek about Russian industri declines in Russian industrial production. That's due to the um, US-led ban on certain critical technologies, including microchips. The G7 agreed to identify additional tech, niche technologies that the Russian economy is, the Russian production is dependent on and go after them. We have options. None of them is cost free. But I don't want to be in the position of telling Ukrainians that it's very hard when what we are, the sacrifices we are asking of our own people can be mitigated. Again, not easy. There's, it's a major political and economic lift, but we do have options. Thank you. Um, maybe um, another question um, related to the EU. Haven't we seen a, a, a lack of urgency, a complete lack of urgency uh, in the EU, um, even um, even you could argue that we are not doing the bare minimum, as George referred to earlier, with, with uh, lots of almost, I think every member state is still currently actually subsidizing uh, fossil fuels in one way or another. If you are not even, uh, if we don't, do not even have the, have the courage to, to take these measures, then what are the, what are the prospects for other, for, for, for really imposing uh, sanctions on, on hard sanctions on, um, uh, Russian oil and gas. Uh, maybe um, Yuri can uh, comment on this if he wants. Um, in general, again, uh, I don't want to sound like uh, we are too um, 
demanding or we're not grateful again for the international support. Don't take me wrong. So I understand it's painful for everybody. Uh, but of course, again, uh, we believe and we see that uh, uh, we need to do more uh, in terms of uh, um, energy sanctions. Um, and uh, also, of course, I understand that sometimes uh, people would say, look, but for example, in Europe, uh, Europe already imposes uh, some sanctions, while, for example, India or China, they impose no sanctions. And, and we ask Europe to impose even more sanctions. But as uh, Daniel said, Again, that's the rule of the game with sanctions. So you don't expand 100% uh, implementation or 100% of the countries to follow it. So there will be some exceptions, but they, they would prove the rule. And the rule is that, again, Russia is getting less money uh, that uh, uh, it would be, be, be getting otherwise. But in order to make, again, Russia use less money, here I would agree with uh, George that... Uh, we should target not just the volume, because with the volume, by the way, it, it's getting into the right direction. So despite, by the way, even China and India buying Russian oil, for example, or some other companies uh, transporting it, uh, volumes are still down, or significantly down, even though there are no sanctions on the Chinese and Indian side. So again, with the shipping sanctions, with other sanctions, we see that, again, volumes are going down. So now the tricky part is, OK, how to drive the uh, the price or the money that Putin is getting uh, uh, down. And that is why I believe that uh, uh, we should be considering again the mechanism, I don't want to repeat myself, uh, mechanism like uh, the uh, transfer cap. Uh, I would also mention that, uh, and I would even praise uh, not just the governments, but ordinary Europeans, that we see some significant decline in consumption based on some more responsible attitude. Uh, to just uh, spend uh, less or waste uh, less energy. So we see, by the way, some huge support of people in, in Europe. They support Ukraine in our fight against this barbaric uh, regime. And they don't underestimate their desire to fight Putin and to fight Putin regime. So they are ready to waste, uh, to uh, use energy more responsibly. They are ready to waste less energy. And they, more, more of them uh, are even ready for higher prices if it really helps us to stop this war. That is why I believe more should be done and uh, uh, we need to work on, on it right now. And um, maybe how, how important are, are other measures, are, are uh, energy savings, in, in, uh, for instance, in this debate? Uh, are we mobilizing uh, EU citizens to, to, uh, uh, to the necessary extent uh, right now? Uh, we are discussing, yeah. I was just briefly mentioned that what we see from numbers, they're hugely important. Uh, again, uh, consumption goes down even now in summer. And also we understand that uh, this winter, it, 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 it was going down uh, since the beginning of the year, by the way, in Europe. Uh, and we see now consumption is down and we see and we talk to people and they say that they will use uh, less and less energy that is produced out of uh, gas, for example, in particular. But I would also mention there are some measures that would allow uh, uh, Europe to use less gas without even uh, having less energy. For example, uh, Ukraine can export electricity. Uh, uh, and th this electricity uh, exports from Ukraine and imports into the EU can replace uh, electricity that is produced with natural gas in Europe. So it will help basically the consumers because it's just cheap electricity. Also less demand for gas by uh, power plants mean, means uh, lower prices for natural gas in Europe. And it's really sad to see that Ukraine cannot export all the electricity we could export. So now maybe this couple of days we started to export uh, like 100 megawatts to Romania. But even before this very widely, uh, widely praised synchronization with the agreed, we're able to export through a so-called island regime eight times more. So now we have the synchronization, but we are exporting eight times less, while we can export 35 times more than we export at the moment, and uh, four or five times more than we were exporting in this, as this uh, island mode. And it can replace up to 10 billion cubic meters of Russian gas. So we're talking about rather significant volumes. So this de-bottlenecking, 
You see, when across the value chain, you start thinking seriously about um, efficient use of energy. The same applies to interconnectors between, for example, Spain and France or uh, use of infrastructure in Germany. So Germans were saying that, look, we could not build floating uh, terminals. It would take us years. So now we understand that up to three or four terminals, floating terminals, will be there in Germany this year and early next year. So if there is a, a, a will, there is a way. With all the engineering talent in Europe, with all the money you have in Europe, you can do much, much more across the value chain to use energy more efficient, not to rely on rogue regimes like Putin or any other rogue regime. Thank you. Um, and something uh, maybe I want to ask uh, uh, George um, is, of course, uh, in re, uh, the Repower EU package is a, is a, is a huge bet on, uh, on LNG. I think almost um, the 155 of, of BCM that we imported last year of Russia, that, that one third of that uh, under the Repower EU pack, package is envisaged to be replaced uh, through LNG. So 50 BCM of uh, additional LNG. But what are actually... Um, is, is this actually uh, realistic for, for instance, um, because the LNG, global LNG market is already very strained and we see, for instance, that the LNG, our main partner in this, is already exporting at full capacity and that one of its uh, major export terminals also recently um, um, had to go out of uh, operation due to uh, technical uh, problems, I think. So are we actually, um, if, if, uh, the gas, uh, the gas is completely cut off from Russia. Uh, is this actually a realistic? Uh, is LNG our best bet uh, in the in the in the near term? So there will not be a silver bullet to to get over next winter without Russian gas. And zooming out a bit again, because I, I find this is for me the, the most important point about the the whole energy debate uh, in Europe. We need to create a situation where Europe is not susceptible to blackmail in winter. Because my personal biggest worry at that moment is that European policymakers uh, in important countries are still afraid that Russia can cut energy in winter and that they are worried about the consequences and might be rather willing to do a seek very, very bad political compromises with Russia in order not to face the situation. And if we are not prepared for this, it might mean that we have a short term increase in comfort compared to a situation of a Russian cut, but with huge long term political consequences. And I think it's a we really should warn everybody and, and all the time that this is what is what is currently at stake. Uh, if we are not preparing for next winter and if Russia threatens the German, the Austrian, and some other governments with uh, with a supply cut, um, the support for Ukraine from those Western capitals might be challenged. And so we should do everything we can. So it's not not only like uh, like Yuri said that uh, that essentially energy saving is the best sanction on Russia implicitly because we are reducing consumption, we are reducing prices, and and reducing revenues for Putin. But it's also for us it's an absolute imperative, and we need to do as much as we can. But there is no silver bullet. We need to work on increasing production, increasing transfers among uh, member states, and uh, making sure that also Spain helps Germany and there is technology available to, to make that possible. We need to, uh, to bring more production uh, uh, into, the, into the system, and we need LNG. LNG, uh, the, uh, the 50 BCM, is what we uh, what we saw at the beginning of this year. So at the beginning of the year, we saw about one billion cubic meter per week additional to what we had last year, which would end up uh, at up to something like 52 BCM per, per year. So it seemed like a realistic order of magnitude. So far, we are still there. But let's see how the how the year goes on. It is a substantial strain on the global LNG market. It's 15 to 20 percent of the global LNG market that we uh, uh, implicitly demand on on top of what has been uh, normally demanded, and it has geopolitical repercussions as we see in Bangladesh and Pakistan. But for now, it is uh, 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 it is working. Um, but kind of let me reiterate. 
kind of saving energy is, is not only kind of uh, reducing the, the war chest of Putin, but uh, it is really kind of, it needs to be done with, with the highest level of political priority. And I'm a bit frustrated that uh, the, the heads of state and government uh, in, in many countries and also the head of the commission have not yet really very forcefully made this point. They left it to the ministers so far, and that's not enough. It needs to be one of the top priority because it's not just economics, it's really the political future. Thank you. I would like to just uh, add something because this is probably the most important point that George uh, actually elaborated on. And that is that in the short term, it's also about the political survival of our decision makers. Because from the moment during the winter period when families start freezing and when industries start closing, uh, I can assure you that nobody is going to think of uh, war uh, in Ukraine or any other relevant uh, uh, global events, but will only think of the survival of their own family. This is the way how it works. And in preparation of such scenario, we need to come up with everything that we have in place. So I would not exclude even a scenario in which we will uh, rely on more fossil fuels in the short term, not against the decarbonization plans or against the green uh, agenda, but actually in preparation of this, because you cannot decarbonize, you cannot transition if you are still relying on a single singular energy supplier and if you are not self-reliant. So uh, anything from reviewing moratorium on shale gas, like it is the case in Romania, increasing uh, uh, even uh, coal burning or considering to continue uh, exploration of uh, nuclear plants, anything that is on the table, we need to be very realistic about it. We should not allow any cleavages among the European Union family. Some member states rely, for instance, on nuclear energy. Others do not want to have anything to do with nuclear energy. We should, uh, we should uh, of course, uh, accept these realities. But it, in the end, it comes, it comes to the uh, to the general portfolio. So we have, at the end, we have to arrive at an equilibrium. And that equilibrium in the gas sector is, once again, 150 to 200 billion cubic meter that we need to somehow uh, keep in mind uh, in the short term. So once again, we need to also explain to the population why it's necessary to move away from certain, from certain ambitious uh, goals when it comes to the nuclear when it comes to the sorry the green transition in the short term uh, maybe a question uh, from the audience that was posed in the in the q a um, um in the q a and also happy to uh, see if there are any other questions from the audience you can uh, intervene uh, by putting your hand up in zoom or you can also uh, pose a question in the in the q a uh, so so the question relates um again to, to the to the oil oil price cap um to to implement an oil price cap and significantly affect uh, putin's income what percentage of of importing countries uh would need to be part of uh the coalition um to in order to be effective maybe uh daniel wants to uh go first for this question Sure, fair question. You would probably need China and India to respect it. Um, I'm looking at a Russian oil, I'm looking at a chart on destinations of Russian crude oil exports. It goes to a wide variety of countries, but many of them are already are in Europe. Ch the non-European countries include China, India, Turkey, Japan. There are others, but that strikes me as a, rel a small enough number of countries 
you probably want to talk to Brazil and South Africa as well. You would also want to have conversations with other countries that don't import oil but export it to make, they, make sure that they understand we'll be watching for diversion and going after sanctions evaders. You could probably do it with a successful set of conversations with a limited number of countries. Now, that's, I don't mean to suggest that it's easy or to assume that getting the Chinese and the Indians on board is automatic. But the G7 has got to give it a try. They've committed to giving it a try. They need to do this. And it's possible, given the Iran experience, that something could be an imperfect but effective arrangement could be put together, either a price cap or as I said earlier, the alternative of going after exchange, convertibility of currencies that the Russians receive in exchange for oil. It's not a hundred countries, put it that way. Thank you. Uh, uh, Yuri, uh, I see you have your hand up. Uh, yes, I would like to add that uh, first of all, uh, at least, uh, I had this conversation with the energy minister from India uh, in May, and he was saying that, look, uh, we're buying, uh, uh, everybody now criticizes India, but we're buying in a year less than Europe buys in a day. So don't uh, exaggerate uh, again uh, uh, this uh, um, option for Russia to sell it to India. Sometimes it's just an excuse, not, for example, to do something what can be done uh, in the West. Having said that, uh, I would just point out to some difficulties with the price cap idea. So imagine a situation when there is a buyer of Russian uh, oil that says, look, uh, my headline price in the contract is, for example, I don't know, $30 per barrel or $50 per barrel. But then through some more complex contractual arrangements, there is a earn out or some kind of prepayment or anything else that gives an economics that is much higher than $50 per barrel. Believe me, it's very easy to construct a contract in such a way when you have some headline price at a certain level, but in fact, what you pay and what you transfer to, to the seller is much more. Imagine a situation when, for example, Russia says, okay, we're ready to buy, to sell uh, oil, for example, at below, let's say $30 per barrel, but I will allow, I will sell it only to companies who invested in Russia, for example. So you bring $1 billion to me, and then I sell some oil to you um, at this price. So there are endless opportunities, how to make sure that on one hand, you are kind of uh, below this price cap at the same time, Putin gets uh, what he wants. So that is why uh, just understanding the complexity of this idea and understanding that realistically it can only work when there is a more or less kind of united front, when, for example, there is a single buyer from the European Union that would say, that's the price I'm ready to pay. Or, for example, like it was in uh, some sanctions with Iran or Iraq or whatever, when there is basically one negotiator that says, okay, these companies are allowed to buy at this particular price. If it's not the case, it's next to impossible to make sure that this price cap idea works as intended. Thank you. Um, and also, uh, maybe something uh, uh, and, and something i read yesterday what was an argument um, where, where uh, uh, was an, was an article where it was argued that in fact uh, the sanctions that are already currently in place are already uh, hitting russia to a significant extent and the reserves that it's currently receiving uh, from from its uh, energy exports to the us and the eu um, uh, it cannot actually really use these reserves because because of the sanctions or because of the financial financial sanctions already in place. Uh, so um, 
that that the that, that energy sanctions would probably more have more chance to to really undermine the support for Ukraine in the, in the West or at least in Europe, uh, rather than actually um, uh, do what they are supposed to do and really hit uh, or disrupt the, the Russian war machine. Um, happy to hear what you. Let me just sorry to uh, jump in, but let me reiterate: record guys, gas prices were before the war. So if you don't solve this problem, that Putin can abuse their, his dominance in the part in the market at any time, again, it's not about the war. So you need to solve this problem first of all. By the way, I believe that uh, the EU antitrust authority, the G competition, should start doing their work. And uh, unfortunately, just the result of uh, some kind of complacency when Gazprom was ready to abuse or was able to abuse their dominance. But that's the problem that we all need to solve. Otherwise, again, prices will remain high. Consumers will be unhappy, but the Russian propaganda will blame it on the war so that there is some pressure to stop this war, not on the Putin side, but on the European side. You see, that's really unfair. So that is why let's not follow into this trap laid out by Russian propaganda. Gas prices are not because of the war. Uh, but if we want to overcome this problem in general, not just with the war, we should use a number of uh, tools. As uh, George, for example, mentioned, there is no silver bullet. Uh, but again, sanctions, smart sanctions, it's just uh, one of the tools in this toolbox. Maybe um, on, uh, let me your... jump. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Then. Um, I just wanted to jump in to say that I'm familiar with, obviously, I'm familiar with the concerns that Yuri laid out. And there have been concerns all along that the Europeans and the Americans could, under pressure of dom domestic politics and economic problems, reduce their support for Ukraine or push Ukraine into premature negotiations. So I'm familiar with the concern. However, the good news is the G7 summit and the NATO summit didn't show any evidence of this. It doesn't mean that those political forces, those concerns are baseless, but it does mean that leaders are still supporting Ukraine and the political will to do so continues. So we need to put that political will to good use and push the Russians hard. I just a, a short comment. Uh, George? Yes, um, I wanted to come back to, to your earlier point, Simon, on whether the sanctions on energy would be, uh, would be binding or whether essentially, uh, because financial sanctions are dominant, uh, uh, the, uh, the energy sanctions don't play a role. And I would disagree with that for, for two reasons. First is, I mean, we see Russia continuing to export uh, energy and they wouldn't do if it wouldn't be to their, to their benefit. So seemingly they have a, have a benefit from, from continuing this trading uh, very empirically and uh, i think the, the money that they are receiving i mean we, for example we we drilled a hole for uh, in our financial sec sanctions essentially for the energy sector so gazprom bank has been excluded from the financial sanctions and other banks as well exactly because we wanted them to to be able to to trade energy so our financial sanctions could also become more more efficient if uh, if uh, a sanctioning energy would be would be completely uh, um, completely wanted on, on our side. Obviously, the picture is quite complex and we, I mean, we have to see those things, uh, things together. And then finally, I think if we, if we, if we see the, the balances of the, uh, of the Russian National Bank, I mean, yes, they are, uh, the, the ruble is still high and we, uh, they, are, they are doing accum uh, essentially accumulation, uh, but it's not like if, we, uh, if, the, if the huge energy incomes uh, would, would be taken away to a significant degree, then 
that not also the financials, uh, the, uh, the energy sanctions could become essentially the most binding element and the more binding one than the, uh, than the, uh, than the import sanctions for them. Um, and I mean, they, they use this money all over the world for, for buying favors in, uh, in, uh, in countries you know, like Syria, Mali, and so on. And these are things that they are paying with hard cash. And if we find ways to, uh, to make that more difficult for them, I think it is an important part of the, uh, of the war effort. I also want to add up something. Uh, first and foremost, there is no doubt that the Western sanctions, uh, those imposed by Europe, but also by the international partners, are the most severe ones, um, you know, in comparison to the previous sanctions imposed on Russia following Crimea's annexation, uh, invasion of Ukraine, and also in previous uh, periods. Uh, the, the problem here is that there is uh, no, in my view, uh, cost, uh, and we still need to be aware of that fact. So on the one side, we should keep uh, keep up the pressure and increase the pressure in terms of sanctions. But on the other side, we need to be also very, very much realistic about uh, the situation from a Russian perspective, namely that no cost will be enough from Moscow's perspective to stop the war. So long as Moscow is pursuing its goals uh, on the ground, nothing will prevent, no sanctions will prevent uh, Moscow from stopping the war, unfortunately. Uh, so I think that uh, in this particular case, uh, the, um, the short term now, the next six months are critical, yes, all the statements, the NATO statement, the G7 statement, the European Council statements actually point to a coherent approach, point to a readiness on the side of the West to uh, continue the sanctions. But uh, once, as I said, uh, the winter period begins and we are still in this precarious situation, as Yuri uh, pointed out several times, uh, we were already in this uh, precarious situation before the war began. Now it is, of course, amplified. Uh, and there are, unfortunately, second order effects coming also from, from the war. Um, we need to be to prepare for the worst case scenario. And that is what I meant previously by actually increasing the awareness, explaining to the population what is going on, fighting Russian narratives. Um, true debates like this one um, is, uh, is, is the way forward. Um, and there is also the situation, of course, once again, when it comes to oil, because Yuri uh, mentioned the uh, Indian case. Yes, the main co-financer of the war is Europe. European powers are still paying for Russian oil. And uh, this is not a secret. Uh, so, uh, of course, India's share increase, 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 increasing the share from 2.5% to 5% uh, is uh, maybe insignificant, but I want to remind you of the fact that uh, India is in the route to becoming world's third uh, economic power in this and probably next decade, uh, and having these two Asian giants uh, with around 3 billion people population, namely China and India, uh, we, uh, we speak about other dimensions. So of course, uh, from the moment when the European Union uh, decided and the West decided uh, on decarbonization in 2015, it was absolutely clear from Moscow's perspective that Moscow also needs to think of its way of uh, you know, um, diversifying away from, uh, from, from this uh, European interdependence. So I, I argue that so long as Russia is able to ship its oil, so long as uh, Russia is able to still engage partners in new pipelines, such as the case, by the way, also with China, there are still a new pipeline deals um, uh, between the two countries. Uh, there are pipelines now being built by Russia in third countries in Asia. Of course, Russia has a plan B. And Russia being this largest combined oil and gas exporter in the world, and being one of the most significant commodities uh, exporters in the world, now unfortunately has of course, in the short term, has uh, strong, uh, still strong cards to play. And we need to make everything possible to, of course, increase 
uh, the price, the costs and the price for Russia to wage every single day to wage the war against uh, against Ukraine. Final point, because I, may, I, I referred to the possibility of the black market and shipping actually Russian oil under probably different flag. I just checked uh, on, um, meanwhile, on the information. And since the beginning of the war, there were more than 180 ownership changes of vessels from Russian entities to non-Russian ones. And this is exactly what I was referring to, that uh, many of these now new vessels uh, are actually, uh, are actually uh, belonging to uh, companies uh, based mostly in Asia, but also uh, in the Middle East uh, and even in Norway. So there are always a ways how to bypass, unfortunately, uh, specifically energy sanctions. Why? Because uh, so long as uh, you have a product that is in demand, and right now following the pandemics, uh, with the surge in demand, uh, there will be still, uh, of course, uh, a huge request for commodities. Um, uh, Russia is, of course, factoring in these realities, and we need to be aware of them and prepare accordingly. So to conclude, I think there is a broad disagreement, uh, a broad agreement that uh, energy sanctions are definitely um, uh, definitely necessary, and that we have to go further uh, to really affect Russia and its war of aggression in Ukraine. And um, I, uh, I would uh, like to uh, thank uh, all the speakers for being here um, today. Um, I would also like, uh, like to thank the US mission for uh, supporting this event. And of course, also uh, to all the participants uh, for joining us today and for, uh, uh, and for the discussion uh, during uh, the Q&A session. Uh, if you would uh, want, want to watch this uh, event again, a recording will also be made uh, available on the website. And uh, I look forward to seeing hopefully many of you again at one of our future events at EPC. Uh, please have a look at our website to see what we still have in store for you um, before the summer break. And of course, in autumn, we'll still be, I think, uh, very much dealing with this topic uh, in uh, uh, dealing with the topic of energy um, when the crisis will probably be um, yeah we we'll probably will already have a much uh, uh, a completely different perspective on things than we have now but uh, thank you everybody for uh, joining uh, for joining us today and hopefully see you again soon um, thank you bye thank you very much <laughs>